This morning's reading is from the Song of Songs, chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young women. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight, I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the, gels, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, yes, we're preaching Song of Songs today. Um, if you have not read Song of Songs before, Song of Solomon, it might be called, you're, uh, I encourage you to do this. And you might find yourself saying, this book is in the Bible? Uh, and for those of you who haven't read it or don't know what we're talking about, uh, Song of Songs, it is indeed a passionate love story poem between two people. Uh, I've never had so many people request Paul to preach a sermon um, than I have this week. As you know, Paul is our, one of our other pastors. He's single, and people were desperate to hear Paul preach on a passage where people were talking very, very centrally about one another. Um, I didn't do it this time, but next time, I guarantee we'll have Paul preach that sermon. Uh, uh, Paul was telling me about another pastor who promised his wife, since the topic in Song of Solomon is definitely about the intimacy between couples, that he had to promise his wife that he wouldn't come up with any jokes on the spot, that he had to run them by her first. And it said the difference between his wife and my wife is my wife would say, there is no joking <laughs> when it comes to talking about this up from the front. Uh, when we're looking at Song of Songs, Song of Solomon, it's a type of genre called love poetry. Um, it is absolutely... Uh, words between two people expressing uh, intimately how they feel, joyfully how they feel. Uh, I can remember uh, someone telling me once about when you're talking about uh, the passion around uh, two couples, they likened it like a fire, right? A fire can be good, it can be bad. A fire uh, on your couch is horrible. A fire in the fireplace, it's a great thing. So uh, the passions that it's talking about indeed are, are very emotional, very powerful, but in the right place is where you want it. I can remember back to when I was, uh, I've been a lot of part, of part of a lot of weddings, not as a pastor, just have had a lot of friends who, who've gotten married, especially when I was in college. Uh, massive amounts of my friends got married while I was, in, while I was still in college. Um, when I was in my junior year of college, uh, I went into credit card debt. The first time I went into credit card debt is because I needed to take out a credit card to pay for all the tuxedo rentals for all the weddings I was going to. My junior year in college, uh, my family can attest to this, I was in 19 weddings. I was in 19 weddings in college. If you, if you know what I'm talking about when you're in college, there's a moment when all of your friends get married, and since all of your friends are in college, everyone's asking each other to be in the wedding. So I had to get a credit card to pay for the deposit for all the weddings I was in. And in all those weddings, there's that moment and during one of the ceremonies, during, whether it's the rehearsal dinner or the celebration afterwards, where people give up and, and they share stories and they're all sharing advice, uh, their advice on what makes a great marriage. And they'll ask the, sometimes the oldest people in the room, the oldest couple in the room will get up and they'll say something like, you know, I just do whatever she wants, right? Or I just remember to say thank you all the time or different things. I remember the moment, one of the most memorable ones for me was at a wedding where the, the bride's family, uh, the wedding was in New York. I mean, the wedding was in uh, North Carolina. The, her family was from New York, deep New York with the accent and everything, New York City. And uh, his family was from North Carolina and they were getting up to do the toast and her grandmother got up to share her toast. And she goes to him, I just, I think you're wonderful. And this is my my granddaughter, and all I want to say, and everyone's like, what is she going to say? If you break her heart, I'm going to break your legs. Um, that was, and that was, it was like, whoa. And they gave like the New York, we're, we're kidding, but we're not kidding. Um, and so what we're going to uh, look at today, so we've been given uh, for whether you're married, whether you're a single, even whether you're a widow, um, uh, the message here is for all of us to hear about. To think. We've given lots of bad examples. This gives some wonderful examples to think about. So what we're not talking about 
is marriage advice or advice for couples. What we're going to look at today are not advice, but expectations. The expectations that God has when two people love one another. So this is not an advice sermon. This is letting us know God's expectations, his standards for a relationship between couple. Let's pray. Lord God, as we look at this um, book that you have in your Bible, Lord God, this is your word. Lord, help us to grow closer to you. We pray for every year, Lord, we pray for all kids that they would not know a day, every parent in this room, that every one of their children would not know a day without you as their savior. And we pray for everyone in this room, everyone at home, that through your word, through you, Holy Spirit, that we would die to sin, and become more alive and awake to you. We ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we're going to have just four different expectations in this passage that I think are being laid out before us. And we're also going to look at how this book also helps us understand God a little bit better. Uh, this Song of Songs doesn't really reference God directly, barely indirectly, but he is absolutely present. But what's important about this is that we're going to see that God uses, Christ uses the language about between two couples, a lot to describe his relationship with us. His relationship with us is not sensual, but it is passionate. It is real and it is deep. And so we're going to see how understanding this also helps us understand him a little better. So let's start with verses two, one through three. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valley, of a lily of the valleys. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young women. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight, I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. So the first expectation that God has is that there is a plan. And the plan is that we were made for each other. If you uh, were to read chapter one, the, the woman in here describes herself. She's like, she says, uh, uh, she works outside. So she's saying she, her, her skin is tanned from being outside and working hard. She's like, I'm, I still feel, Jesus says, I, I still feel like I'm wonderful on the inside, but the outside of me, I'm not too much to look like, to look at. And uh, right before chapter two, verse one, the, the man tells her how wonderful she is unapologetically. And his um, wonderful, um, just awe-inspiring love for her changes the way she views herself. So she started off by viewing herself as something kind of, uh, but like, you know, I'm pretty on the inside. And now through the love of this guy, the words of this guy, she describes herself as a rose or a lily. His words to her have given her confidence in who she really is. She's not some simple, ugly flower. She's beautiful. And then in verse two, now that she's saying, I'm, I'm a rose, a lily of the valley, he looks at her, let's put up verse two. And when he looks at her, he says, no, you're not just some rose or lily. What you are is a lily among thorns. You stand out. You're not just okay. Everything is bland compared to you. Whoa, right? That's some intense language. And then she responds in verse three saying, oh man, you are like, you are like a shade in a hot day in a forest and you're like an apple tree, right? She's like, I'm hot and parched and you're just so yummy. That's what she's saying. <laughs> it's okay. We can laugh. This is emotional language here. She's like, you're yummy. You are wonderful. I can't get enough of you. This uh, reminds me a great deal uh, of how it's supposed to look. In Genesis 2.18, the, the place where we learn um, about uh, God and making Adam and Eve in the garden, we have the passage here in 2.18 where God says, the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. When we talk about God has to have... A, God's saying there is a plan and there is the big point is there's a bigger plan behind this is that there's no accident that a man needs a woman, a woman needs a man and that they find each other. There's no accident, if you read the New Testament as well, that some people don't. 
but you need to see that there's a plan behind it. And God looked at man and said, you aren't good alone. We need someone for you. Not just a man and a woman. So just like when God created man and said, it's not good for you alone, you need a woman. In the New Testament, when Christ is describing our need for him, in similar language, he's saying, listen, you need me. So just like man needs woman, this passage is definitely saying, I want to be with you. We were made for each other. In the New Testament, we see Christ talking about our hearts, saying your hearts, again, not in a physical, intimate way in that sense, but in a spiritual way, your hearts were made for him as well. Sin ruins everything. In the Bible, when we talk about when people were trying to lead their own way and do their own thing and ignore God's plan, you know what God calls that in the Bible? Having a hard heart, a stiff neck. God's constantly telling people having a hard heart, having a stiff neck means you're ignoring God's plan for you, for who you, who has created you, the woman he's created you to be, the man he's created you to be, ignoring that. But in John 15, 5, again, about that we've been designed to be with him, just like a husband and a wife are designed to be together. Your heart, your spiritual heart has been designed to be with Christ. I am the vine. This is Jesus talking. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is he that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So God is using similar language that just like Adam and Eve, you're supposed to be together. God is saying to each and every one of us, we're supposed to be together, but for a completely different reason. Actually, a better reason. Now let's look at verse 2, 4. He brought me, so this is now... Uh, the woman talking again. He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. He brought me to the banqueting house. This is the house of celebration. And what does that mean? His banner over me is love. Uh, I'll take an example from, uh, from my family. My family never misses an opportunity. And if you know us well enough, you've hung around, we never miss an opportunity to celebrate something. Uh, I'm not talking about everyone gets a participation trophy. I mean, if anyone does anything that's great or something fun, we celebrate that sucker, right? It's time to go out. Woohoo, right? It's time to celebrate. We want to celebrate. We want to let them know, in our family, we want to let them know that we are excited about what just happened to them, whatever it is. When she's talking about his banner, remember, she's viewed herself as kind of uh, 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 something that wasn't great. And he's now loving on her. And now she's saying his banner over me is love. I have a couple pictures. Sorry, I put out order. I have a couple pictures I want to show. So the, if you want to go to the, the flower pictures, the first picture is how she viewed herself, right? Uh, she's, she's now uh, this thorn. And then... When God, when this man comes along and talks to her, this next picture, she sees herself as this beautiful rose, right? First, she's like, I'm thorny. And the guy comes along and says, no, you're wonderful. You are wonderful. I'm letting everybody know and sees herself as a beautiful rose. And then he tops it and says, no, you're not a rose. You're a lily among thorns. The banner over me right? If you think of an army general going into battle, an army going to battle, you wave, you would wave your battle standards. You would let everybody know who you are, where you're coming from, what you're about, and where you're going. The banners let everybody know that. And she is saying, he's taken me this thorny, this thorny thing. And he's setting up camp, putting up banners saying, I love this woman. So if the first thing we need to understand, the expectation is there is a plan you need to acknowledge. There's a plan at play and you got to follow that plan. The next expectation is this, that your relationship should be a party. We are made to celebrate one another. We are made to celebrate who God has made, the person, the people around us. This is especially talking about obviously the context of a husband and wife, a relationship that's intimate. You should be celebrating this person, publicly celebrating this person. And you know how Paul, the apostle Paul describes what it looks like when you're celebrating this person in the New Testament? Ephesians 5.21 says this, 
submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It goes from there where he talks about a husbands are to love their wives to love the husbands. I mean, his wives submit to husbands, husbands love the wives. But all that is under the context of 521, which says, submit to one another out of reverence. The way we put our banner over the person we care most about is by submitting to them. Submitting isn't about putting you down. It's about lifting them up. Got it? This guy is lifting her up. He is saying, she stands out and I want her. And I want everybody to know it. We should be celebrating who the other person is. And the logic of what that really, really looks like is submitting, lifting your partner up. That's what it looks like to celebrate them because you're lifting them up. You want all to see who this person is. Now we talk about again what it looks like between an intimacy between two couples. Christ uses similar language when he's talking about the party he wants to have with us. Now what is sin? Again, sin raises its head at each one of these points. What does sin do here? Well, sin destroys what we have with God. And we're talking about this big party, this big celebration. Basically, sin uninvites us. Sin prevents us from coming to this wonderful banquet, this wonderful celebration under this wonderful tent that God has set up. But God used, Christ uses this similar language when he's describing what it's like to know him. Remember, not in an intimate, not in that physical kind of way, but in a spiritual context, what he says in Luke 14, 6, he's describing what the kingdom of God is like. And he said, a man once gave a great banquet and invited a lot of people. We describe heaven as a humongous banquet. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we say it's a small taste of what we're going to have at the great feast in heaven. And if you've ever been to a wedding feast, you're there to celebrate the couple, the love between the couple. And our celebration is a celebration of what Christ has done, how he has loved us. Our big banquet isn't about us loving God. It's about him loving us, him declaring to all people, he loves us. Sin prohibits that. Christ invites us. But again, this is how it reminds us of Christ. This is how this can help us understand Christ's emotion around us. But don't miss the fact, this is definitely a, two couples saying she loves the fact that her husband is celebrating or her betrothed, not married yet. She loves the fact that he is celebrating her. Let's look at verses two, five through six. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples for I'm sick with love. She's still talking about the guy. His left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples for I am sick with love. Let's get sappy, right? His left hand is under my head. His right hand embraces me. So if the first one, again, God has an invitation, you understand there's a plan. God has an expectation that you will party, celebrate here. God has an expectation that there will be passion between you. We are made to be passionate for each other. Let's look at that, that verse again, five through six. She is saying, I am sick with love, right? That means, you know, uh, that's, that would be us saying like, oh, when, when, when I see this person, I, 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 get, I get lightheaded, right? <laughs> my, my knees give out. I get butterflies. I am sick with love, meaning like I'm just not okay. I love him so much that I'm just not okay inside here. I have two questions for you. How do you describe your feelings for your partner, your significant other? See, this passage is not telling us, you, you do not, the goal here isn't to sound like this guy or this woman. Your job is to be passionate in your own way for your spouse, for those of whom you love. So your goal here isn't to be like, I need to come up with flower language like this. No, your job, your job is to think about what does it look like for you to be unashamedly passionate for your partner in life that God has given you. 
Husbands, how does it sound when you talk about your wife? Wives, how does it sound when you talk about your husbands? We're, te- we're being shown here it's okay to be passionate. You're being told there's an expectation here. You are passionate. Again, now let's look at how this can remind us of Christ. Wouldn't you say that Christ is absolutely passionate, unapologetic about us? Again, in this spiritual saving context, this is definitely saying husbands and wives, you should have this romantic passion. It looks just like yours. Don't worry about what it looks like on TV or in books. You find out what it looks like for you. But Christ is also very passionate about his relationship with us. Christ is absolutely okay when it comes to passion. God created intimacy. Here's one of my favorite passages I learned in seminary. Uh, We're looking on, go back to Genesis 2. Uh, This is verse 23 now. So we talked about how God God created Adam and Eve. And so this great moment where actually it says... um, where God presents Eve is just like, a, a, like when a dad walks uh, the, his daughter down the aisle. And it's, it's that same imagery. This is, the first, this is where marriage was created. This is the first marriage. He's walking her down. He sees her. And the translation we get is, this is the last bone of my bone because they were you, he, you, God, when God took part of him to, to make her, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she should be called woman because she was taken out of man. And I, uh, uh, my uh, uh, Hebrew professor said, listen, Um, It says, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh should be called woman. But really, if you wanted an accurate translation of what Adam said when he saw Eve, it would be, and I quote, hubba hubba. (laughs) He said, this this is just, they're they're trying to to, to, to write and, and translate what, what emotion Adam had, but he's saying, I, I, this is everything. This, this, if you took song of songs and put it into one verse, this is that. It doesn't sound as wonderful, but it's actually meaning the same thing. This is, a, 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 it's, it's an accurate, but not a, a good emotional accurate translation of what Adam is saying. He's saying, the, 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 this person is, is what I've been missing. There's no one else I could ever dream of. God created intimacy between couples. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. But also, again, Christ uses similar language. Again, not in the intimacy way, not in the the physical sense, but in a different kind of way. Again, sin rears its ugly head. When God talks about Sin. Remember we talked about how being a part of the party, what sin does, it uninvites us. And here, God refers to the relationship you have with him. When you violate the trust you have with him, uh, he, he, he responds like he's been jilted. There's enmity there. It's very personal. Christ is, Christ is passionate about us and he is absolutely devastated, passionately devastated by sin, by the things we do, the things we think, the things we feel, the way we treat each other. He is passionately devastated by it. When spouses abuse or anger or frustrate one another, that devastates him. When we do that to each other, when we sin, He is devastated by that. But again, is Jesus okay with passion? There's a great passage that tells us that, I think, pretty clearly. And uh, Mark 14, 6, uh, a woman is coming, and she comes and she breaks expensive perfume to lavish it on Jesus. She's being passionate. She is showering it on him. And people say, we got to calm this down. And he says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Christians should be passionate. We should be passionate about our faith in Jesus Christ, passionate about righteousness, passionate about how horrible sin is, and passionate about those whom the Lord has brought into our life to love. But make no mistake, this is also talking about the passion between two lovers who are in love. Now let's look at verse 2-7. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. 
Again, the first one was understanding there's an expectation of a bigger, under, acknowledging there's a bigger plan at play. We were made for each other. This is a party. We need to celebrate one another. There is passion. We need to be passionate for each other. And lastly, purity. We are to be pure for one another. And guess what? This cuts to those who are single, those who are married, those who are waiting to be married, those who are widows. This applies to every one. Every one of us. Purity is a wonderful thing that matters. It's the way that God has intended for us. Chastity, purity, those are things that bring wonderful things to a relationship. You can bring purity to a marriage. Got that? It doesn't just mean one thing. You can keep yourself pure even while you're married. You can do it before, you can do it after. If you're not married, you can still maintain purity. It adds to your marriage because the more you're understanding and striving after purity in that relationship, that intimate relationship, doing it before or after, what you're doing is trying to set aside that person or a relationship with Christ apart from what the world or what your heart wants you to do. It adds to, it's a, it doesn't sound like it, but it actually adds to the joy. This is one of the devastating effects of pornography. You're, you're slicing up your heart and giving it away, and you're not reserving that for your intended. There are many consequences and many things where pornography comes from. But God is saying this, this purity Hold on to that. When she says, don't awaken to love, she's saying, listen, God has created this one. God has created a progression. It's supposed to be, she talked about, you know, she sampled the apple, she wants a little more. It should be that when you're engaging with someone, you find you like them, you should want them a little bit, a little bit more. And it's normal to want them more and more physically. That's the way it's supposed to work. But again, she's saying right here, but we want to do it in the right way at the right time. We don't want to go too far too soon. One commentator said, this is about everything emotional, right? Churches shouldn't emotionally try to get you to do anything. And nor should we try to do anything before we do it. We don't want to jump, put up a warning sign. <laughs> no jumping. <laughs> don't go before you are ready. Again, this is something wonderful that adds to it. And, and all of us, many of us, again, even if you've messed this one up, you can always repent and cling to it again. It's not all or nothing. Some of you might be thinking, Satan whispering in your ear saying, well, you messed up there, might as well do whatever you want. No. Always be chasing after that. Never stop. Again, how does sin affect this? Well, the purity of relationship, again, so when your relationship isn't kept pure, what do you do? A lot of times it ends in divorce. How does God describe it when sin enters into our relationship? He literally describes us as adulterers. When we chase after other gods, after idol, other idols, God says that's like you're being an adulteress. And you know what that wonderful Lord says? Listen, you've committed adultery, but come back. I know what you've done. Come back. There's so many, that could be a whole sermon series in and of itself. But see the importance of purity in a relationship. Again, whether you're single, married, been married for a long time, you're a widower, it always matters. We've come now to the end. When Paul, the Apostle Paul, is trying to sum up this whole thing about being intimate with your significant other. He has two places that I think are fantastic. The first one is one of my favorites, 1 Corinthians 6.18. Flee from sexual immorality. He's saying, listen, <laughs> do you guys understand what the word flee means? It means you're running for your dear life. <laughs> flee doesn't mean I'm going to see if I can handle this. Flee means run the other way. Paul is saying when it comes to this stuff, to this purity, don't even try to fight it. Run away. Run away 
from the things that are going to add impurity into your life. And that should extend to the things that are going to add to your faith and take away from your faith in Jesus Christ. If there's anything that's going to do that, flee. Just like you would flee from sexual sin, flee from it. But I love the term flee. When the first time I heard a message on this, there was a professional athlete. Uh, I was uh, a senior in high school. Uh, a big professional athlete came to talk about this. He goes, he goes, he's like, I'm big, I'm huge, I'm full of muscles, which he was. And he goes, and I need to flee from sexual morality because what it's going to bring into my relationship with my wife and what it's going to bring into my relationship with God. Paul is saying flee. But you know the other half of that, which is so wonderful? When Paul is being asked to describe the intimate relationship between a husband and a wife, what it looks like when two couples, now Paul was, Paul was single himself, what it looks like when two couples get together, I think Paul does a masterful job of talking what it's like. What he does, it's, uh, in, uh, it's in Ephesians 3, uh, sorry, Ephesians 5, 31 to 32. He quotes Genesis, that same passage in Genesis about Adam and Eve, That same passage Jesus himself quotes. And so Paul is basically quoting Jesus, quoting Genesis. He's talking about what is it when a couple understands God's plan, understands the party, the passion and the purity in a relationship. He says, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This, is a, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that refers to Christ and the church. He's basically saying, listen, all I know is that the way God intended for couples to be joining together and how wonderful and majesty and wonderful it is, it's, he's basically saying, listen, it's, it's crazy, it's wonderful, it's spiritual, and I can't explain it. What a great way to understand what it's like when God brings two people together. It's a profound mystery. (laughs) Why and how he does it, but he does it. And our faith is absolutely related to it. So let God's word here in Song of Songs, let these two lovers talking challenge you in how you love your significant other, how you were waiting for your significant other. And my last word is this, everybody, I just gave us four expectations. And if you think you're going to get them right, then you've missed everything I've said. We are going to fail at these expectations. We're going to fail them in ourselves. We're going to fail trying to do them for our spouses. And this is why you don't look to advice. Don't look to media. Just look to the cross. Look to Christ to fulfill your deepest longings and needs. And when he does that for you, you're able to graciously love your spouse. You're no longer trying to get from them what they can't give, your eternal significance and eternal purpose. You're no longer putting the weight of being perfect on yourself. It is all on the cross. So when you're trying to figure out what it means to be passionate, to celebrate, look at how much Christ celebrates us. How passionate he is for us. How he set himself aside for us. And let that challenge you in the way you unashamedly love your significant other. Or how significant you are waiting for them. So now... If you're looking to the cross, you're relying on grace. I mean, with Hebrews 12 too. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Don't look to others. Don't look to advice. Look to the cross of Christ for everything you need. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, We are not perfect, and we bring that imperfection to our relationships. Lord, for many of us, we are struggling with doing things now that are detrimental um, to our relationships with those of whom we love or um, to what we're doing to ourselves now in anticipation of waiting for that one you're going to bring us. Lord God, I pray that we would see your grace. We would know that you came because we are not perfect. 
You set perfection before us. Lord, when we read Song of Songs, let it be a challenge to us that you have created us as passionate beings with emotions. Let us not hide from that. Let us trust you with all that we are, especially with those relationships that matter most. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please stand for our final song.